Hey guys, it's Chris from Highland Guitars and you're watching another episode of From the Luthiers Workbench. This episode's gonna be a long one because I'm gonna talk about how I pulled off the finish for this guitar. And I'm gonna cover everything from sanding the raw wood all the way up to buffing out the high gloss shine. The goal for this project was I wanted to mimic a hand rubbed oil finish using nothing but water-based products. Now I've talked about using water-based products before in the past. In this video, I'm going to be updating and um, revising some of the techniques that I've talked about in the past. And a lot of this is based on what I have learned over the years, as well as um, developments in the product technology. So let's jump into this and get started because it's going to be a, a long one. The first step in applying the finish to a guitar body and a guitar neck is I need to sand the surface and prepare it to receive the finish. Now, as you know, I use a CNC machine to do all my cutting and carving. And when I use the machine, I set it up to run a rough cutting pass and then a finish pass. And with a CNC machine, you can actually set up the finishing pass to make the surface almost smooth enough to start um, applying the finish. Maybe all you need to do is just a light sanding with some 220 grit. However, I've found that in the interest of time, it's better to um, go with a, a less of a um, detailed finishing pass. Instead, I, I just use a, a quick finishing pass and then I resort to using my random orbital sander and I'll sand from about 80 grit all the way up to 220 grit to get the surface ready. Now, for this particular project, I decided I wanted to try a different type of abrasive sanding product with my random orbital sander. In the past, I use hook and loop paper discs. And I'll, like I said, I'll sand usually with 80, uh, 100, 120, 150, and 220. Well, the product I decided to give a try is Merca's Abranet. Now this is very different from the paper discs. It's actually a mesh and it comes with a interface backing pad which you attach the uh, disc to. And it's available in grits ranging from 80 all the way up to 600. And I picked up, um, it's an assortment kit and that includes 80, 100, 120, 150, 180, 220, 320, 400, and 600 grit. Now, like I said, I typically sand from 80 to 220, so the higher grits, um, I didn't bother uh, to use those. But in the past, when I've been using the hook and loop paper discs, one of the problems I run into is um, I can always expect to find the occasional area of curly Q scratches left over from the random orbital sander. And it seems like no matter how hard I try to avoid those, they still seem to show up. And the problem is, is you can't see those until you start to apply your finish. And then all of a sudden there they are. Now when that happens, you've got to let your finish dry, and then you've got to go back and sand those areas, usually by hand, to try to get rid of those curly Q scratches so that you can proceed. Well, with the uh, Abranet, I found uh, I had no issues whatsoever with curly Q scratches and that uh, was sanding all the way from 80 grit all the way up to 220 grit. Not a single curly Q scratch anywhere on the body and that to me is worth its weight in gold. And the other nice feature of Abranet is one of the problems uh, a lot of folks encounter when they're sanding their guitar bodies is around the uh, sides of the guitar where there's open end grain. Uh, it can be really tough to remove sanding scratches from those areas and it can be really frustrating and it seems like no matter how hard you try to sand, you're going to have problems with that, with scratches in, the, in, in that open grain area. And that's usually around the back some areas on the sides, in the cutouts, around the front. But I found with the Abranet, there is absolutely no scratches remaining from the sanding process. It's just smooth, clear wood. And 
<laughs> you know, just like the problem with the curly Q scratches, that itself uh, makes it worth the price. And, you know, it's not terribly expensive. I think I paid about $26 for the assorted kit. And I, I estimate that these sanding discs should last uh, two, maybe three, maybe even four guitars. Um, so I think you can get good life out of these things. Now to make them work uh, to their fullest um, uh, ability, you're going to want to make sure you hook up a shop vac to extract the dust as you're sanding. It just seems to work better. So um, I sanded from 80 all the way to 220 grit. And another nice thing is they are flexible, so you can do a little bit of hand sanding if necessary in some of the hard to reach places. So um, I'll put a link in the description below so you can go uh, check these out yourself if you're interested in picking up um, one of these assorted packs or you can buy them individually, uh, like I said, from 80 grit all the way to 600. All of the products that I'm going to be using for this finish are going to be water-based. And what my goal is, is I want to try to mimic a hand-rubbed oil finish. I love hand-rubbed oil finishes. I've been using them for years. The only thing is, is I, I don't like the, uh, the length of time it takes for the oil-based finishes to cure. I also don't like the oil-soaked rags that can burst into flames if you don't take care of them correctly and I don't like the fumes. So what I want to try to do is mimic that look using water-based products. And all the products that I'll be using are from Crystal Lac. And I'm going to be using their wood grain filler, and then I'm going to be using their color pigment system, which I can use to make my own colored stains. And it's a pretty simple process. It comes with eight different colors, and I can mix different ratios. And what you do is you mix them into their clear gel stain, and that's what gives you the stain that um, can be applied to the surface of the wood. And if you're not comfortable mixing your own stain, maybe you don't understand the best way to mix the ratios, Crystal Lac will send you their recipe guide, and it shows all different color combinations and the specific amounts of each pigment that you need to add to create those different colors. So it's real simple. And you can mix it up in um, a quart or a pint or half pint. Um, you can even do a quart if you want to. It's a pretty simple way of doing it. Uh, this is the mahogany color which I mixed up. And in my tests, it has worked very nicely. I have gotten a really nice color here. So I even applied it to the front just to see how that's going to look. But um, what I plan to do is apply the mahogany stain to the back and then I'm going to do a, a more of an amber tint to the top. But the first step is going to be to fill the grain and that's going to involve a simple two-step process. The back of this guitar is mahogany and mahogany is an open grained wood. And what that means is not only can you see the grain, but you can feel it as well. And what would happen if I didn't fill the grain is later on when I apply my clear coats is that texture from the grain and the pores would telegraph up through and I won't have a smooth surface. Now it's not absolutely necessary to do that. It just depends really on what you want as your outcome. And since I don't want to be able to feel the grain on this guitar, I want a nice smooth surface, I'm going to have to fill the grain. And as I said before, I'll be using the Crystal Lac wood grain filler. Now the beauty of this is it dries clear and I can add a tint to it, then apply it to fill the grain and then sand it off and I'll leave the color just in where the grain and the pores are and that's a way of accentuating and making this grain really stand out. But before I can fill the grain, since I don't want grain filler on the, the maple top, which doesn't need it, I need to mask it off so that none of that grain filler 
will get onto the maple and that could cause problems with my stain adhering correctly later on. So that's the first thing I've got to do is just use some masking tape and get that maple area masked off. And I'll just work in smaller sections. I'll put that tape right on the edge of the maple where it meets the mahogany. And I'll just work my way all the way around the perimeter of the body. Okay, so I have the top masked off and I am ready to start mixing up my grain filler to apply to the back. And as I said, I'm going to do a two-step process. The first is going to be to mix in some tint in order to accentuate the appearance of the grain. So I'm just going to scoop out a couple of spoonfuls of the grain filler. As you can see, it's really thick stuff. This, uh, as it's formulated in the container, it works really well with um, woods like ash, which has a very prominent grain structure. But I think for mahogany, I'm going to thin it down just a little bit. So And I'm just mixing it up in these little dollar store cups. That seems to be the affordable, simple solution. Dollar store cups, dollar store spoon. And then I'm going to take the black Kraftnik pigment. And I'm just going to put a little squirt in there. Not a whole lot. It doesn't take a lot. It doesn't have to be absolutely black either. It just needs to be a darker color than because normally the um, crystal lac grain filler dries clear. This will add some colors so that it's more opaque. Then I'm adding a few drops of the brown and then I will just stir it all up. And as as I'm stirring this I can tell it's just it's going to be too thick for what I want so I'm going to add a little bit of water just a little bit, not a whole lot. Get that stirred up and that greatly reduces the viscosity. It'll be almost like a paint. And the reason I'm wearing a blue glove is because I'm going to spread this around the surface with my fingers and since there's a tint in it I don't want to stain my fingers. Okay, now that's a pretty good consistency. Uh, we'll just pour it on there. As you can see it's kind of a gray-brown color and then I just swirl it around, get it all completely covered, work it into the grain, into the pores. It takes about an hour for the crystal lac grain filler to dry to a touch. Now you'll remember I said this is going to be a two-step process and the second step is going to actually come later on uh, after I've applied my color stains. But for now, I can go ahead and remove the masking tape and I'll let the guitar sit for an additional 24 hours before I move on to the next step because I want to make sure that the uh, grain filler has fully cured before I continue. After a 24-hour cure time, I was ready to sand off the excess with my random orbital sander and a Merca Abranet 220 grit disc. I've sanded off all the excess tinted grain filler, so there's no filler on the surface. Instead, there's only filler in the pores and in the grain, and that makes it stand out more. I'm not sure if you can see that on the video, 
but it is quite a bit, there is a greater contrast. It's quite a, the grain is quite a bit darker. So now what I need to do is I'm going to mask the top again like I did before, and then I'll be applying my mahogany, it's sort of a reddish brown mahogany stain. Okay, so I have the maple masked off because I don't want my first color of stain to uh, get on any of the maple. I'm just going to be staining this uh, mahogany base first. So what I have done is I have mixed up my stain and this stain consists of about four ounces of the clear gel stain medium. Then I added about an eighth of a teaspoon of the uh, red pigment, then two teaspoons of the brown pigment, and then finally another eighth of a teaspoon of black. So that's how I get the color that you see here. Now to apply it, I'm just going to use a foam brush, and I can really just apply this just like that, just straight on there, and then just start brushing it. And as you can see, I get this nice mahogany red color. It soaks in very nicely without being too um, opaque. It leaves a nice transparent, and you can see how the uh, grain filler that was tinted that brownish black color is really standing out nicely. And the color goes down very consistently and that's I believe uh, partially uh, due to the fact that the pigment is probably a very fine um, grain size, grit size or grain size, pigment size. Uh, it's kind of like uh, aniline dye aniline dye is very intense and it goes down uh, with a very rich color and it goes down very consistently so this works a lot like that and I don't want to gunk it on to the sides too much because I don't want any seepage underneath that masking Okay, so now I'm ready for the fun part. I'm going to put down my secondary color, which is uh, an amber pigment. And I mix this up with, uh, this is actually about six ounces of the uh, clear gel stain medium with, uh, it's about a quarter teaspoon of the red pigment, a quarter teaspoon of yellow pigment, and then two to two and a half teaspoons of the brown. And I kind of played around with it a little bit until I got uh, the exact ratio to give me the color that I want. But this is one of those situations where you can follow the, the recipe or even your own estimate of what the color should be, but you're going to want to test on scrap to get an idea of uh, what your final color is going to look like, and then you can make adjustments accordingly. So I'm just going to go ahead and put this down, and then we'll just start to It's got that nice kind of a golden hue to it, golden amber. Now, in my opinion, the, the, um, the way you would judge the quality of a dye stain is its ability to pop the grain without, you know, just on its own, without having any other colors added. Because a, a lot of folks like to put down um, a dark color first and then sand that off and then go back and put a light color 
over the top. Now you're probably looking at this thinking, wow, that's really strong. It's almost like a mustard yellow. And what I plan to do is I'm going to lightly sand it back once it's uh, completely dried. So it will actually get uh, quite a bit lighter. Okay, so I'm in the process right now of sanding off the excess color on the maple. And I'm using just some 220 grit sandpaper wrapped around a rubber eraser. And you can already see the difference between this side and this side. This side has a, a deeper, more intense color, whereas this side, it's a little more subtle. And um, sanding is actually, good, for me, is going to accomplish two things. First of all, I'm, you know, since I used a water-based product on the wood, the grain has been raised. And by sanding it like this, I'm removing that raised grain so that the surface will be nice and smooth again before I start to apply my final clear coats. And of course, it also helps to lighten the color. You know, if you wanted to leave it this color, that would be fine. But I wanted to really lighten it up. I wanted to, to, to be more of a uh, kind of an amber gold color, sort of like when you apply boiled linseed oil or tongue oil to flamed maple. And that's kind of the look I'm after. So I think this is going to get me pretty close. We'll know for sure once I've applied the clear coats, but uh, I think that's, that's going to be a pretty close match. Now, one thing you should bear in mind when using water-based dyes and stains is that once they dry, they dry really flat. And you might think, wow, that's pretty dull. That's kind of lifeless. But then once you put your clear coats over the top of it, it will come right back to life and look fantastic. So just keep that in mind. So I'm pretty happy with how this color has turned out. And I'm ready to move on to the next step, which is the second application of the Crystal Lac water-based wood grain filler. Now this time, I'm gonna be applying it straight from the container without tinting it. And I know some of you might be thinking, shouldn't I put a seal coat down first to prevent the color from lifting or reactivating? And it isn't really necessary with the Craftnik pigments because when I mixed it up, I mixed it into the Craftnik clear gel stain. And this serves not only as a base for the to mix the stain, but it's also a binder. So once it's applied to the wood and allowed to dry, it's dried permanently to the surface, just like you know paint. And that actually affords some opportunities um, to do some different creative things. For example, you can layer colors and not have to worry about reactivating an underlying color. You can also, since the viscosity is sprayable, you can spray, you can mask off a design and spray your colors and have that nice hard edge. Uh, that way you don't have stain colors bleeding into each other. But that's, you know, a different topic for a, uh, a different occasion. And maybe I'll do something, um, do a video in the future showing some different uh, creative possibilities. But um, what I'm going to do now is go ahead and start applying this grain filler. And one thing I should mention is I'm not going to mask off the, the, uh, the, the maple uh, because it doesn't matter whether I get the grain filler on the maple at this stage. I've already applied my color, so I don't have to worry about that, you know, the grain filler posing a problem with the, the stain. So, in fact, when you're dealing with figured wood, like this figure, this flame maple, what you're dealing with is on the surface uh, where you see these dark stripes, that is end grain. And the lighter stripes is face grain. Where there's end grain, that's an open pore structure. So later on when I'm applying my clear coats, it's likely going to absorb into the, those areas of open grain. So I'm gonna go ahead and put my wood grain filler over the entire surface of the guitar and that way I don't have to worry about the finish soaking in unevenly on the surface. It's just going to lay down flat on the top. I like to apply the grain filler using my fingers and I'll just rub it in and try to get it as smooth as possible. And I'll just rub it this way until it appears as though the grain filler is starting to dry. And that seems to give me the smoothest surface because like I said, a smooth surface is critical and the smoother you can get it, the less work you have to do later on uh, when you're trying to level sand 
your clear coats. After the Crystal Lac wood grain filler has dried, the next step is going to be to spray three to four coats of Crystal Lac sanding sealer. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I want to build up a surface that is thick enough to where I can level sand it without the risk of sanding through and into the color below because obviously I don't want to do that. Now, um, before I spray that, I'm just going to take some of my uh, 3M 216U sandpaper in 800 grit and I'm just going to lightly scuff sand the surface. And the reason is, is I want to try to take down some of the high spots that were left over from applying the wood grain filler. You know, and I made a concerted effort to try and apply that as smoothly as possible, but the very nature of wood grain filler is, is you're going to have some uh, lumpy areas that need to be taken down. But I don't want to do a full level sanding at this point because that wood grain filler is just too thin and I'll run the risk of sanding through to the finish. So that's why I want to get it uh, ready for the seal coats. I'm using my Earl X 5500 HVLP spray system to apply the sanding sealer and I'm using a one and a half millimeter needle and I've got the fluid adjustment knob turned out two full turns. At this stage I have sprayed four coats of the Crystal Lac water-based uh, sanding sealer and when I would spray it, I would put down a coat, let it dry, and then I would scuff it with my uh, gray 3M Scotch-Brite pad. And I've now got a surface that I feel is thick enough to where I can confidently sand level without running the risk of sanding through and into the underlying color. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to level sand with the finest grit I can. And since I'm using 3M's 216U free cut gold sandpaper, the finest grit that's available is 800 and that's what I'm going to use to level this. Uh, I realize some folks like to level with a coarser grit like 220 grit. The problem I found is when you sand with 220 grit and then try to spray a clear coat over it, when that clear coat dries, you can still see those scratches and then ultimately to cover those scratches and fill them in, you've got to spray at least five coats without doing any sanding in between coats. And that's just not the ideal way to do it. So I'm going to sand this sanding sealer really smooth with 800 grit. And the good news is that sanding sealer is really easy to sand, so I shouldn't have any problem getting it level with 800 grit. Now if, you know, by chance I run into any spots that are excessively rough and that I can't seem to take down with the 800, I can back down to um, like a 400 grit and sand it. But then even after I uh, use the 400 grit, I'll uh, step up to 600 and 800 because I want the whole surface to be a uniform 800 grit scratch pattern. And as I'm sanding, the uh, semi-gloss shine that uh, the uh, sanding sealer gave me will slowly turn to a matte finish and I'll know I'm done level sanding when I can no longer see any shiny spots. If there are any shiny spots that represents a low spot and it needs to be leveled. So uh, as soon as I've eliminated all the shiny spots on the surface, all front, back and sides, then I'll be ready to start spraying my uh, Crystal Lac Bright Tone uh, instrument finish. Now I like to use a circular sanding stroke because it is more aggressive and gets the job done faster. Also, even though this is a no-load sandpaper, it will still get little pearls of finish um, built up on its surface. So it's good to have like a piece of a sheet of paper towel handy so that you can just wipe off those uh, some of that buildup, and then you can keep working. Make sure that you stir the Crystal Lac Brightone instrument finish and then strain it before you spray it. To spray the Crystal Lac 
bright tone instrument finish, I'm using my Earl X5500 HVLP spray system with the same setup that I used when I sprayed the sanding sealer. Now I know a question that's going to come up is how many coats of bright tone instrument finish do you need to spray on your guitar? Well there really is no right or wrong answer to that. Uh, I would say a minimum of two coats just to get decent coverage. However, if you want to do more you certainly can. There really is no maximum number of coats that um, you can spray, but just keep in mind in order for Crystal Act Bright Tone to achieve um, proper hardness you need to allow for adequate dry time in between coats and that's usually two to four hours depending of course on temperature and humidity. I typically will do three coats a day, one in the morning, one midday, and then one in the evening. And then I'll do that for two days so that I have a total of six coats. But you can definitely go you know, more than that. I have on occasion sprayed as many as 12 coats with no issues. Just bear in mind that to, to get that, that proper hardness, you've got to allow for that adequate dry time. It's been two days since I began spraying my Crystal Lac Bright Tone Instrument Finish, and I just sprayed the sixth and final coat about an hour ago. And at this point, it has dried to a touch so I can handle the guitar without fear of smearing or damaging the surface. Now, I took great care in making sure that I sprayed this um, uh, bright tone very smooth, and I'm really impressed with just how smooth it is, and that means the level sanding and polish sanding process should go very quickly and, and won't be too difficult to do. However, before I can do that, even though it is dry to a touch, I need to let the surface cure, and that will allow uh, the Crystal Act Bright Tone to achieve maximum hardness and maximum uh, scuff, chemical, and water resistance. Now, uh, typically if you're spraying like two to three coats of the, of the Bright Tone, you should give it at least three to four days to cure. And if you're spraying more than that, my rule of thumb is, given the fact that I uh, the room where this will cure is 68 to 73 degrees and fairly low humidity. I'll give it a day per coat. So since I sprayed six coats, that means six days of cure time. If you're living in a cooler temperature or higher level of humidity, you might want to consider doubling that. So it would be two days per coat. And um, that should uh, allow you to... Um, play it safe in terms of being able to level sand without any issues. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hang this guitar up, let it cure for six days, and then I'll be back to discuss the method and technique for level sanding, polish sanding, and then buffing it up to a high gloss shine. Well, it has been six days since I sprayed the last of my Crystal Lac Bright Tone Instrument Finish Clear Coats, and that means I'm ready for the next step, which is to level sand the surface in preparation to buff it up to a scratch-free mirror gloss shine. Now, if you're new to this process, you probably are wondering, why do we have to level sand the surface anyway? Well, if you look at the way the light is reflecting off the surface of this newly sprayed finish, you'll see that it isn't really sharp and crisp. It's actually kind of broken up around the edges. And that's because no matter how carefully you spray your clear coats, and it doesn't matter whether it's a water-based or solvent-based finish, they always have a little bit of a slight texture to it, and that gives you that kind of rough, coarse, uh, reflection. So in order to make that reflection mere glass smooth, we have to level sand. The technique I'll be using to level this surface is wet sanding. And if you've followed my videos in the past where I've talked about using water-based finishes, 
I've often advocated for a dry sanding technique and the advantage of dry sanding is you don't have to wait for the finish to cure. You can actually give it about 12 to 24 hours and then begin the level sanding process using the dry sanding technique. However, dry sanding in my opinion is a bit of a more advanced technique. It requires specialized equipment and specialty abrasives. It also uh, demands a fair amount of experience and skill in order to be able to pull it off. So for the a hobby builder and the weekend luthier uh, or small shop luthier like myself, I prefer using a wet sanding technique. It just means that you have to let the finish cure um, for about a week before you can begin using the wet sanding process. And the reason for that is if you try to wet sand too soon after spraying your last clear coat, the uh, compounds that are in that uh, product could reactivate and soften, which is something you don't want it to do. To wet sand, you'll need to use a container that will hold about half a quart of water with a couple of drops of liquid dishwashing soap. And the reason for the dishwashing soap is uh, not to get too into the, um, the chemistry behind it, it just makes the water a little slipperier and that aids in clearing the residue that will be generated as you're wet sanding. Uh, I also will use a rubber sanding block and in this case I'm just using a rubber eraser that I picked up uh, from the dollar store. You can get a three pack of these and they work great for wrapping sandpaper around as you're uh, level sanding. And speaking of sandpaper. What I'm using is a waterproof silicon carbide sandpaper and sandpapers are manufactured to different standards and the paper that I use is manufactured to the European standard and I'm not going to get too detailed into the whole uh, difference between all the different standards but you know it's a European standard because in front of the grit designation is the letter P and any of your P grade sandpapers uh, as they're often referred to are manufactured to the European standard and what that means is the abrasive particles that are used on the sandpaper are a more consistent size and uniform shape. A lot of folks when they wet sand will start out with about a P800 grit and then they'll work their way up to the finest grit they can get a hold of which is typically about a P2000, sometimes a P2500. You can also uh, start using what are known as micro mesh abrasives and those can take you all the way up to 12,000 grit. However, my philosophy when it comes to level sanding and wet sanding is to start out with the finest grit you can get away with and still get the surface level and then use the fewest number of grits possible um, to get the surface ready for the final buff. Now since I'm using a buffing machine with buffing wheels I can actually start with about a P1200 grit to get the surface level and I can finish with that same P1200 grit. I don't have to work up through a lot of different abrasive grits. However, if you're going to be hand buffing the finish, it may be necessary to move up to progressively finer grits in order to get the surface to where you can actually hand buff it up to a scratch-free high gloss shine. But for, um, for me, it's just uh, the P1200 and that's all I need to do. So what I'll do is I'll cut a piece that's large enough for, to wrap around my sandpaper and I'll soak it in the water for at least five minutes um, to get the uh, paper uh, saturated with the, the water. And then what I'll do is I will wrap the abrasive around my sandpaper. And then what I'll do is I'll put a little bit of water on the surface and I will begin sanding in a circular sanding stroke over that 
just a small portion of the surface. I don't try to do the entire guitar at once. I just work in a small area. Now as you begin sanding, you can actually feel the surface. It feels kind of coarse and as you continue to sand, it gradually will become smoother feeling. And I'll continue this way for a minute or two just until I start to see some of the uh, residue that's being generated into the water and that will appear as sort of a white milky cloudy mix. Once that starts to appear I can stop and I'll just drop my sandpaper back into the water and then I'll grab a dry paper towel. In this case I like to use Viva paper towels because they're almost lint free and then I'll just wipe that surface and remove the water from it. And what you'll begin to notice is that the surface, the shine that was originally there, is being replaced with a flat matte sheen. And don't panic, it's supposed to do that because the flat matte sheen represents the high spots and any shiny spots represent the low spots. And what you're trying to do with the leveling is you're trying to bring the high spots and high areas down even with the shiny low spots. And once you have the entire surface covered in a uniform matte sheen, then you'll know that you have finished level sanding. And if you're gonna be moving on to the next grit, you can then proceed to do that. Um, and it's important to remember that when you do switch from your level sanding grit to the next finer grit, you have to, to start out with fresh water and you need to make sure you completely clean all the residue off of the surface. And um, you can do that with a clean um, paper towel and a little bit of denatured alcohol just to wipe it down and to get any of that that residue off the surface. But as you can see, if you look closely, you can see those uh, that mixture of flat matte sheen and those shiny spots. So I have to continue sanding in this area until all those shiny spots are gone. And this is what the surface looks like after the first minute of wet sanding. And this is how the surface looks after the second minute of wet sanding. And this is what you're going to want the entire surface of the guitar to look after you've finished leveling. Now one of the things you have to be aware of when wet sanding with water is that if water hits the bare wood, like or inside these holes, it can cause the wood under the surface to swell. And when that happens, as you're sanding, you strip off the finish wherever that wood is swelling. It also um, affects the appearance and it doesn't look all that great. So before you wet sand in an area where you have holes, one of the things you can do is to take some um, paste furniture wax and put some on the edge of a q-tip and then just ring the inside of that hole so that the water won't soak in and cause the wood to swell. As you're level sanding, you want to be very careful about sanding too close or spending too much time around any of your edges or roundovers because that can cause sand through if you uh, inadvertently focus too much attention there. So what I do is I just, I try to focus on the main area and stay not necessarily completely away from the edges, but I just try not to like round over as I'm sanding. And that's one of the reasons why I like to try and start with the finest grit that I can get away with. And one thing you can do is when you first start to sand in a small area, if that 1200 grit the P1200 grit is not doing it for you, you can always back down to a P1000 and then even if necessary go down to a P800. However, I would try really hard to go with the finest grit possible. But you should be able to sand each area in two to three minutes before moving on to the next one. If it takes longer than that, you may want to consider uh, moving down to a slightly coarser grit 
Now once I have finished level sanding the large areas, I can then go back and very lightly sand just the corner edges uh, or any roundovers. And I'll just do that by holding the sandpaper by hand and very lightly sanding the surface. And again, you can feel the texture. And as soon as it starts to feel smooth, you're done. You don't have to spend a lot of time here getting that corner edge smooth. Since I'll be buffing my clear coat finishes up to a high gloss shine using my buffing machine, I can stop my level sanding process after that initial P1200 grit wet sanding session. However, if you're going to be trying to use a hand buffing process with clean cloths and liquid uh, rubbing and polishing compounds, you're going to probably want to take your wet sanding process to a finer grit, which means after that initial P1200 grit leveling, you would follow that with a P1500 and then a P2000. You can go finer if you can source the, the abrasives, but I don't really feel it's necessary even with a hand buffing process. Now just remember that when you switch each uh, uh, grade of abrasive, you're going to want to start with a fresh container of water with a little bit of that uh, liquid dish soap and make sure everything uh, is cleaned off on and around the guitar so that you don't contaminate each um, finer grit with the previous grit. And also remember that uh, the, while the process is essentially the same with the circular sanding stroke, because you've already done all your leveling, the following grits, the, the P1500 and the P2000, will take much less time because all you're trying to do is replace the previous grit sanding scratches with the grit you're currently using. Um, so it should take far less time. My buffing process is pretty simple. I'm going to start on this side of the buffing machine and this is a wheel that is fairly firm and I'll be using a Menzerna yellow polishing compound. That's their medium compound. It's a solid bar. And then once I have buffed out uh, the surface of the guitar with this wheel, I'm going to move on to this wheel, which is a much softer flannel wheel, and I'll be using a Menzerna Tan Extra Fine Polishing Compound. Again, a solid bar. My buffing wheel spins at about 900 RPM, and it turns in this direction. So when I buff, I will make contact down on the lower half of the buffing wheel. That way, if something were to catch, when it would get thrown down rather than getting thrown up at me. So that's just a safety precaution. Okay, so this is what I call the window test. And it basically gives you a pretty good idea of the shine that I was able to get after buffing out the Crystal Lac Bright Tone instrument finish. And I have to say that in my humble opinion, uh, Crystal Lac Bright Tone instrument finish buffs out better than any other water-based product that I've ever used. I am really happy with its performance and I think you can see just how beautifully this stuff buffs up to a very high gloss mirror-like shine. Well, I think that concludes my how to apply a water-based finish onto a guitar video. And I've talked about everything from raw sanding the wood all the way up to um, filling grain, applying the stain, spraying the clear coats, wet sanding, buffing it out. It's a lot of stuff, and that's why this video has taken so long. So I hope that you find information in this video that's of use to you, that will help you to um, maybe take the plunge and start uh, doing water-based finishes on your guitars. And as always, I encourage you um, 
to hit the like button, hit subscribe so that you can be made aware of uh, future videos that I post. And of course, if you have any comments or questions, be sure to post them down below and I will do my best to answer them. So uh, until the next episode of From the Luthiers Workbench, take care and we'll see you soon.